Welcome to the Forest Path Podcast, a podcast sharing the teachings of awakened meditation masters of the modern era. In this episode of the Forest Path Podcast, I'll be narrating an extended Dharma teaching by the great forest meditation master, Venerable Ajahn Tate Desarangsi. It is titled, Only the World Ends. It's a very well-rounded teaching and goes into some depth about Samadhi. Because it is so long, I'll be breaking it into two episodes, with this being the first episode of the teaching, Only the World Ends. Stay tuned to listen to the concluding part of this teaching by a true meditation master of the Thai forest tradition. This teaching was published for free distribution by Patanasuksa Publishing in Bangkok. May you all benefit from hearing this gift of Dhamma. Only the World Ends by Venerable Arjan Tet Desarangsi The Buddha appeared in the world as the Supreme Teacher by attaining complete enlightenment through his own unaided efforts. Once awakened, he taught the truths that he had realized to all humanity. The things he taught were marvelous, but rational and free of superstition. They could be understood by all those who dwelt on and contemplated their meaning. The Buddha never forced anyone to believe in him or adopt his teachings. Those who listened to and pondered over his reasoning, feeling satisfied and in agreement with it, freely became his disciples through inspiration and conviction. This is not always the case in other religions and sects, some of which actually forbid analytical assessment of their doctrines. Buddhism challenges all to scrutinize its teachings to the utmost and examine its arguments until one sees their truth clearly for oneself and thus may profess to being a Buddhist in freedom. Consequently, the views and practices of all those who have accepted and taken up the teachings will be in concord, not through coercion or prior agreement, but in accordance with the following. Stage 1 Conviction in Kama and its Results Kamasika Kamadayada Kamayoni Kamabandu Kamapatisarana Yang Kamang Karisanti Kalyanangva Papakangva Tasa Dayada Bavisanti Firm and steadfast conviction in these six points for all one's life is needed. As soon in our lives as we develop any self-consciousness, we devote ourselves to the performance of kamas, if not by means of the body, then with speech or mind. It is impossible to remain inactive. This is called kamasaka. Every action produces results. If not good, then evil. If not productive of merit, then of harm. It is unavoidable. Thus body, speech and mind, having performed kamas, must experience their results. This is called kamadayada. The result of our good kamas will lead our body, speech and mind to be born in a happy condition here and in future lives. The result of our evil kama will lead our body, speech and mind to be born in a miserable condition here and in future lives. This is called Kama Yoni. The Kama performed by body, speech and mind in previous existences dictate the varying circumstances in the present existence. This is called Kama Bandhu. We are born because of Kama, and once born, we cannot remain motionless and inactive. There must always be action in order to keep ourselves alive, if not good action, then evil. As we must depend on those actions to, to sustain our existence, kama is called kama patisarana. 
Thus a person should decide for himself what kama to perform, for good and evil kama belong to no one but ourselves. It is kama alone that causes the diversity among beings. No other person, no other thing possesses that power. Thus it was said, Kalyanang va papakang va tasa dayada bhavisanti. These six teachings about kama must be trusted in resolutely by Buddhists for all their lives. Human beings are born because kama have not yet been terminated. The old kama that brought us to birth lead us to perform new kama, and these new kama in turn are the cause for rebirth and continued arising of kama in future lives. Also, all kama arises from this single stream of bodily action, speech and mind, so it is said that kama are of all the same stock or tribe, they are all related to one another. One who has conviction in kama and its results in the ways explained is called a Buddhist, or one who has reached the first stage of the threefold refuge. Stage 2. Constant upholding of the five precepts. If one has conviction in kama and its results, then it is extremely easy to keep the five precepts. The Buddha forbade the performance of evil, and in refraining from evil actions, one at the same time upholds the precepts. The Buddha gathered all the unwholesome kama, all the different forms of evil, under just five headings. Whatever and whenever an action is performed, it must lie within the sphere of these five categories. The mind is the initiator of all things, and so the Buddha taught mental restraint. The mind decides to refrain from causing the death of living beings. The mind decides to refrain from appropriating the belongings of others. The mind decides to refrain from sexual misconduct. The mind decides to refrain from lying, coarse speech and divisive speech. The mind decides to refrain from the taking of intoxicants. A person who is able to uphold these five principles is called one who is able to keep the five precepts. They embody conduct that contributes to the happiness of all humanity. One who is unable to refrain from those actions is called virtueless, and his conduct contributes to the unhappiness and distress of humanity. Thus, all the sages exemplified by the Buddha have refrained from every kind of evil and harmful action, and then taught and encouraged mankind to follow their example. One who believes in kama and its results as explained, and protects body, speech and mind with the five precepts, has penetrated Buddhism to the second level. Now that person must determine subsequently to cleanse his mind through the practice of samadhi, firm one-pointedness of mind. But if one has not yet realized the truth of the basic principles of Buddhism, if one's views are not in agreement with the teachings, believing, for example, that kama uh, that one has performed can be passed on to others, or their effects mitigated by others, then how could one possibly expect to cleanse one's mind through meditation? Some people say that the precepts are concerned with bodily action and speech alone, and that the mind lies within the province of samadhi. Whatever actions are performed or words spoken, one samadhi is unaffected. In other words, they say that body and mind are quite separate. I really can't grasp this point. No matter how much I contemplate it, I just can't understand how it could be so. May I show my ignorance a little here? Suppose a person is going to commit a murder or robbery. Firstly, there must be an unwholesome kama arising in the mind. Then he conceals himself, and then when a suitable occasion presents itself, he kills or steals in accordance with his original intention. Now at the time when that person forms the intention to kill or steal, and when he conceals himself, even though he is not breaking any precepts, 
isn't his mind in an unwholesome state and primed in every way to do evil? If the person's mind is protected by mindfulness and he restrains himself from any evil action and emerges from his hiding place, then no precepts are broken. So we can see that the mind is of central importance. It is the mind that is the fundamental cause for the breaking or upholding of the precepts. That being so, how could one possibly assert that in the maintenance of virtuous conduct, one may discount the role of the mind? The Buddha taught that all things have mind as their chief, are preceded by mind, are mind made. All speech, all conversation arises from the mind. There can be no discussion of Dhamma that does not deal with the mind. The phrase, all Dhammas are preceded by mind, is particularly clear. The words, all Dhammas, cover every kind of action. Good actions are called Kusala Dhamma, and bad actions are called Akusala Dhamma. Neutral actions, neither good nor bad, are called Aviyakata Dhamma. These are abbreviated as merit, harm, and neither merit nor harm. As for this last point, there is not a person in the world who doesn't create harm of one sort or another. In my investigation of the causal nature of things, nowhere have I ever come across the teaching that precepts are the sole concern of body and speech, and samadhi the sole concern of the mind. If my recall of the books is inaccurate, or if I have misread them through my own stupidity, then I have fallen foul of my own limitations. There is even a case of a monk who wanted to disrobe because he felt that the disciplinary rules were too numerous to be kept purely. The Buddha said, Do not disrobe. If you think that there are too many rules, then just look after your mind. There, you see? Not only did the Buddha teach that in maintaining virtuous conduct, the mind must not be neglected, but he even said that protection of the mind alone was sufficient. So I'm quite baffled as to how anyone could keep precepts while ignoring the mind. A layperson may keep five precepts, eight or ten, but the latter may only be kept on occasions. Similarly, with the 227 precepts of a monk, a lay person may keep any of the rules he wishes. The Buddha never for forbade it, but one shouldn't make any formal vows. In one of his former existences, the Buddha was a potter called Jyotika. Jyotika's parents were both blind, and he supported them by bartering the pots he made for food. One day, Konagamana Buddha, forgive me if I've remembered it wrongly, sent some monks to ask Jyotika for roofing material to repair the Sangha's lodgings. Jyotika stripped the roof off his own home and offered it to them. That year, Jyotika's house had the sky as its roof for the entire rainy season, but not a drop of rain fell into it. One day, the king of the land invited Konagamana Buddha to take his daily meal in the palace and, when the meal was over, he formally invited the Buddha to spend the coming rains retreat in a grove in the royal park. But the Buddha said, Your Majesty, I have already accepted an invitation from Jyotika the potter. The king then said, Am I not the mightiest personage in the realm? For what reason do you refuse my invitation? What has this man Jyotika to commend him? So the Buddha related to the king the whole story of Jyotika's good conduct. And when the king had heard it, he was greatly impressed and inspired. He ordered his attendants to load up ox carts with various goods such as rice, pulses, sesame seeds, ghee, butter and oil, and take them to Jyotika. When Jyotika saw all the cartloads of goods arriving, he asked who had sent them and the royal attendants answered that they were a gift from the king. Jyotika said, The king has many burdens and many responsibilities. As for me, I only have to make enough to feed three people. It's no great trouble. Please respectfully inform his majesty 
that I request permission to return all these things to him. Jotika was a person of strong conviction. He would not even dig the earth to obtain clay for his pots. He would take the trouble to look for rat mounds and collapsed stretches of riverbank where the earth had already been disturbed. If a virtuous layperson could keep such a refined monastic training rule, then the coarser rules should not be so difficult. It's as if the Buddha laid down the five precepts as a standard for the world. Any good conduct entails abstention from the five prohibited modes of conduct, and any evil conduct must be based on them. There is no escape from these five points. One who is to attain to the threefold refuge must hold firmly to five basic principles. Being mindful of the Buddha. Being mindful of the Dhamma. Being mindful of the Sangha. Not putting faith in rites and superstitions, having conviction in karma and its results, believing that good actions have good results and evil actions evil results not believing any external supernatural agency can protect one from dangers or disaster. Restricting material support to Buddhism The laity can formally resolve to keep five of eight precepts. As for the ten precepts or 227, they may keep particular rules but should not make any formal declaration. The precepts of virtuous conduct consist of a set number of prohibitions against unwholesome actions, but they don't limit the number of such actions that lay people may refrain from. This applies to monks and novices also. The Buddha laid down that lay people should keep five or eight precepts, novices ten, and monks two hundred and twenty-seven, merely as a basic standard as a way of marking the differences in station between laity, novices and monks. Human beings meet so much evil and unwholesomeness, it seems that we can hardly move an inch without making some bad kamma. The Buddha gave us the following concise instructions. Go to the mind. Before anything else, take hold of the thinker. The mind forms the desire to perform harm with the body and so directs it to kill, steal, or commit sexual misconduct. The mind forms the desire to perform harm with the tongue, and so directs it to lie, to speak coarsely, to scold, or to gossip. The mind forms the desire to perform evil with the body by making it go crazy, so it has the body get alcohol, pour it down the throat and swallow it, allowing it to act in various crazy ways. On the other hand, if the mind shrinks from harmful actions with intelligent shame and fear, if it sees the suffering inherent in the intention to act in such harmful ways and forms, no desire to do so, then body and speech become virtuous. If a person sees the mind present in bodily action and speech and is able to maintain awareness of it, he or she will see all that all harmful actions, all virtuous conduct, all phenomena in the world arise from this same one mind. If there were no mind, there could be no evil, no virtue, nothing at all. To keep all the precepts purely, we must hold to and look after the mind. I once heard a monk say, Monks have 227 precepts. You lay people have only five. You should look after them well in case they get broken. If you break one precept, four will remain. If you break two, there will be three left. If three are broken, only two will remain. And if four are broken, only one will be left. If you break all five, that's it. Monks, on the other hand, have 227. Even if a monk breaks as many as ten, he still has loads left. That monk's words show that he was merely keeping the precepts on the level of body and speech and not on the mind level. He didn't realise that the mind has already become unwholesome through its intention to transgress training rules. Still, it's quite amusing to hear somebody boasting of the number of precepts they keep as evidence of their superior virtue. In fact, 
The monastic discipline that the Buddha laid down pertains to body, speech and mind. The bodily and verbal expressions indicate the mind, that which thinks and conceives, and then compels body and speech to act accordingly. The Buddha established the monastic discipline as a path of practice for the monks and novices to follow, and it is a great blessing to us. He forbade the performance of actions bad, unsightly, or inappropriate for contemplatives, for the benefit of the monks themselves, not for anyone else's, not even his own. The Buddha, having become a refuge for those of us who had been unable to find a refuge, points out the way. It is an immeasurable blessing. It is difficult for anyone who has not penetrated to an awareness of the mind to keep the precepts. If they are kept, it will be as a burden, in the way that a cow herd looks after his cows, merely looking forward to nightfall, when he can herd them into the shed and go to relax and have a good rest. Such a person doesn't realise that we keep precepts for the purity of body, speech and mind. The more precepts we keep and the longer we keep them, the greater the purity. If we can keep them for as long as we live, then that's excellent. We will be able to abandon all evil actions in this life alone. Not being acquainted with the virtue that is our nature and not understanding the virtue that consists of the acts of abstention, which prohibit the performance of evil, we blame the Buddha for laying down more rules than we can keep. Some people say, the longer you remain in robes and the more you study the discipline, the more prohibitions you run up against. This is an offence, that is an offence, and so the more you accumulate bad karma. It would be better to ordain for just three or seven days. Then you wouldn't have the chance to break too many rules. It is truly saddening to hear that sort of opinion expressed. Buddhism has been promulgated in Thailand for more than 2,000 years now, and yet the light of the Dhamma has still not shone into such people's hearts at all. It's really pathetic. They are like tortoises guarding a lotus, impervious to its beauty. When it penetrates to the heart, we no longer have to look after our virtue, it looks after us. Whatever posture we are in, whether standing, walking, sitting or lying down, Virtue is alert, restraining, preventing transgression. Even if the thought to do something evil arises in the mind, there is the knowing of that thought and a feeling of shame shrinking from the proposed action before anyone else is aware of what is happening. How could feelings of anger, ill will and vindictiveness arise in the heart when it has become brimful of kindness and compassion? Virtue is normality of body, speech and mind. Once the mind loses its normality, then bodily action and speech must also, because they are under the sway of the mind. Therefore, those who truly wish to attain virtue and penetrate the Buddhist teachings must train their minds in meditation. Stage 3. The Practice of Meditation practice of meditation does not go beyond this same training of bodily action, speech and mind. Whatever method is employed to develop samadhi, it must encompass the training of all these three things for it to be authentic Buddhist meditation. The sole concern of Buddhism is body, speech and mind. They are the foundation and teachings on virtue, samadhi and wisdom do not transcend it. Whether we're speaking of Buddhism in general, the threefold training, or the stages of enlightenment and nibbana, we do not go beyond body, speech and mind. As long as we are dealing with the conventional level of reality, everything short of the unmediated nibbana of the arahant after death, it is inevitable. In the practice of meditation, take up maranasati, the recollection of death, as the preliminary object. Consider death thus. One day or another I will certainly die, because all life is ended by death. When I die, I will have to leave everything behind, including all that I love and cherish. 
using the recollection of death as the preliminary meditation object is the ultimate skillful means because contemplation of the breath eventually merges into death meditation, as does the contemplation on unattractiveness. After contemplating death, we feel no attachment to things. All that remains is the mind itself in the state that we call cleansed. There comes a moment when the mind merges into the state of samadhi, that is to say, it stops motionless, devoid of all thoughts and ideation, but aware. The duration of the state has no fixed limit. It will depend on the strength of the mind. Sometimes in the course of cleansing the mind, when it has become divorced from all mental activity, as I have explained, it will suddenly drop into a state in which all kinds of vision arise. If so, don't grasp onto them. They are a serious obstacle. If you grasp at them, samadhi will degenerate. But most people grasp at them anyway because they take those visions to be strange and marvellous. Some teachers even advise adopting them as one's meditation object. I don't know whether this is because they have never seen or experienced these things themselves or whether they just don't realise their destructiveness. Some people practice meditation using anapanasati as their preliminary object, contemplating the in and out breaths. If at the end of an inhalation we didn't exhale, we would die. If at the end of an exhalation we didn't inhale, we would die. Our death is such a small thing, just an in-breath or an out-breath. Then taking hold of the mind, the breath disappears by itself without the meditator realising it, leaving the mind in solitude, radiantly clear. If mindfulness is strong, that clear, bright mind will last for a long time. But if mindfulness is weak, it will last for a short time and may merge into bhavanga, the life continuum, the functional state of subconsciousness. There are many variations in the way the mind enters bhavanga. In one case, as the mind begins to unify, it indulges in the bliss and tranquility that arise and so enters Bhavanga where it loses all self-awareness and experiences a state like deep sleep. Awareness just completely disappears and the condition may endure for many hours. Some people at the moment of entering Bhavanga see all kinds of visions, some of them true, some of them false. On emerging from that state, some they can remember and some they cannot. Other people experience an abrupt shift into that passive state. There are many variations depending on the character of the meditator. Although it is true that bhavanga is not the path leading to freedom from suffering, it may lie on the path to purity. Those who are training the mind are bound to enter it in the initial stages of samadhi development. There is nothing anyone can do to prevent it happening if mindfulness becomes weak. If it happens frequently until you become familiar with it and see that it's not the right path, things rectify themselves. Sitting unconsciously isn't so bad anyway. At least it stops mental agitation for a while. It's better than sitting thinking about this and that day and night. If we don't see a thing for ourselves, we don't know what it is. Having acquired a thorough knowledge of something, we don't get fooled by it again. Some meditators focus on asuba, unattractiveness, as their preliminary object. They may contemplate the whole body from head to foot as be being unattractive, or else particular external features such as head hair, body hair or nails, or else one of the internal organs, such as the liver, intestines or mesentery. In every case, the contemplation is continued until one clearly perceives the object as unattractive, putrescent and offensive. To begin with, one should contemplate by means of comparison. Taking an external object, such as the swollen corpse of an animal or a dead human being, one reflects that one's own body will reach that same state. Following from this reflection, there ensures a progressively clearer perception of the nature of the body that culminates in a calm and sobering sadness, at which the mind converges in samadhi, 
motionless and one-pointed. If mindfulness is weak, the mind, taking delight in the tranquility and bliss of the state, will enter Bhavanga where it will exhibit the states that I have mentioned in the sections on Maranasati and Anapanasati. When the preliminary object is discarded and the mind becomes still and impassive, some people experience various kinds of nimitta, mind-made phenomena, devoid of any external referent. The vision, a bright light like that of the sun or the moon or else celestial beings, ghosts and spirits. Out of delusion, some meditators grasp onto these visions, causing the state of samadhi to degenerate and disappear. When nimitta visions arise, certain ajans teach their disciples to consider them as stages of attainment, as the four levels of the noble path commencing with stream entry. They say that to see the nimitta vision of a small light the size of a firefly is to attain the sotapanna stage. A slightly larger light the size of a star is to achieve the sakadagami stage. To see a larger light than that, one the size of the moon, is to become an anagami, and to see a large light the size of the sun is arahatship. Taking an external light as one standard rather than the degree of purity in the heart is to be far from the truth. When the disciple who has the desire to achieve different levels of attainment speaks with the Arjan, he is asked about the lights and so takes himself to have actually realized those attainments. However, the Arjan doesn't ask about defilements and the disciple has no idea how much defilement is present in him or how much has been brought to an end. Then, in a moment of anger, his face goes beetroot red and his enlightenment vanishes completely. For some people who have been taught to concentrate on nimitta visions, they arise in the beginning of practice, but subsequently not at all. That being so, how could they be anything real? Most nimittas arise from bhavanga, and how could bhavanga be the path when it is specifically obstructive to it. It is true that non-Buddhists, rishis and yogis for instance, practice samadhi and they have been doing so since before the Buddha appeared in the world, but they are able to attain merely mundane absorption. Only the Buddha is able to teach supra-mundane samadhi. Those who have attained jhana assume it to be samadhi and so become pleased and satisfied with it, they become attached. Jhana and Samadhi have similar characteristics. If a meditator's contemplation of them is not truly thorough, they will perceive them as being the same thing, because one can change into the other and because they share the same object. They differ only in that with Jhana, the mind absorbs into feelings of tranquility and bliss that arise, and so enters Bhavanga, whereas with Samadhi, mindfulness is constant. The mind is strong and resilient and refuses to indulge in pleasant feeling. The meditator is unconcerned whether or not the mind unifies, devoted only to maintaining the contemplation of the meditation object. Although it is true that nimittas are not the path to purity, every meditator must eventually pass through the experience of them, because when the mind converges or enters bhavanga, they are bound to occur. Formerly, when gifted meditators experienced these nimittas, whether they freed themselves or not depended on their own mindfulness and wisdom, or else the correctness of their teacher's counsel, for when encountering these phenomena, one needs the advice of a teacher. Without a teacher, one may get bogged down in the quagmire of a nimitta for a very long time, as did Alara Kalama and Uddhika Ramaputta two meditation masters who taught the wayfarer Gotama before his enlightenment. Gnosis, knowledge which presents itself spontaneously to the mind and is of a spiritual nature, and the various kinds of nimittas are generated from the preliminary meditation object after the mind has merged into bhavanga. There are a great number of these meditation objects. The forty mentioned in the scriptures 
include the 10 recollections, the 10 cemetery contemplations, and the 10 casino contemplations. There are many more that are not listed in the books, but by means of which the disciples of the Buddha became fully enlightened. For example, one monk attained arahatship while sitting on the shore of a lake by contemplating the sight of a heron swooping down to catch a fish. The effectiveness of a meditation object depends on the individual's disposition. Any object is permissible if it agrees with one's personality. The 40 meditation objects found in the texts are not comprehensive, but they do form a basic framework. Similarly, I have given a summary exposition of only three of the most important objects. If a meditator should find that none of them suits him, then it's quite all right to use something else. But do take advantage of just one object. If many are taken, the mind will become restless and full of doubts. Concentration will be unsteady. When the contemplation has been sustained for some time, the mind will merge into a solitary stillness. Here the meditation object should be discarded and attention focused on that still and impassive mind. If the meditation object is not put down, discursive thought will soon reappear and the meditator will be prevented from focusing on the mind. This principle applies to both jhana and samadhi. If rather than watching the knower, the meditator grasps at a nimitta or at gnosis when it arises, then when the phenomenon ceases, he is unable to focus on the mind. Closely observe these three things, the mind, the nimitta, and the act of perceiving the nimitta. When nimittas or gnosis arise, these three things will be present simultaneously. If one is unable to focus on the mind, the one who knows, then when the nimitta or gnosis disappear, the one who knows will disappear with it and will never be apprehended. The role of the meditation object is to enable the mind to converge into the unified state. When that one-pointedness has been achieved, then the meditation object should be discarded and attention focused solely on the sense of knowing. Any meditation object that produces convergence is valid, but whichever is used, let meditators investigate thoroughly how the same object may, on producing unification of mind, result in bhavanga or samadhi. For example, with maranasati as the object, one contemplates death until one sees clearly that sooner or later death is inevitable, that it must be faced alone, that all one's possessions must be abandoned, even one's loved ones are left behind. When one sees this clearly, the mind focuses exclusively on the subject of death, lets go of all else and merges into bhavanga and may disappear completely for a time. Otherwise, consciousness may switch off and disappear for a moment, rather as when falling asleep, and then awaken in another world, the world of the mind. In this other world, one experiences and perceives in the same way as in this world, but everything is more intense and cannot really be compared with this world. It can only be appreciated by the mind experiencing it. In other cases, the mind enters a state of impassive stillness. In both cases, the process is called merging into bhavanga. When contemplating death, the mind will evolve into samadhi if, as the mind unifies, vigorous and resolute mindfulness is established to prevent it from entering bhavanga. The meditator contemplates how birth comes about, how death comes about, and what follows death until a clear and lucid knowing arises in the mind, accompanied by a buoyant sense of well-being. There is no rapture, as rapture is a factor of jhana. This state is called samadhi. The states of samadhi and jhana arise through contemplation of the same preliminary object, but the mind that enters jhana and the mind that enters samadhi differ. 
With jhana, the mind dwells on the object of death motivated by the desire to experience the bliss of tranquility, and so enters bhavanga. With samadhi, mindfulness is strongly and firmly established, and one contemplates death in order to clearly understand every aspect of it. One gives no thought as to whether or not the mind will converge. The aim is to see clearly. However, the unswerving nature of the contemplation of a single object ensures that it naturally evolves into the state of samadhi, a state of clear knowing and joy in the contemplation of the object. Although initial reflections on the object are not one-pointed, clarity and illumination of understanding are experienced in one point at which all doubts vanish. Whatever meditation object or technique is employed, the passage into jhana and samadhi is always differentiated at the moment of convergence. In fact, the best thing would be to not bother with the terms jhana, samadhi and bhavanga at all, but simply to observe the mind as it converges. Then one will very clearly see the differences for oneself. The adept, one who is fluent enough in jhana to enter or leave it at will, may, if he has developed it in former lives, choose to exercise various supernormal powers. For instance, he may see visions of himself and others who have, in previous lives, been fathers, mothers, sons and daughters, or those who have harmed him and were enemies. In some cases, there is the ability to remember the names of the people and places in question. This is called Atitam Sanyana. Some meditators might see a vision and the knowledge arises that oneself or another, perhaps a family member, will die on such and such a day or in such and such a year or will endure some kind of suffering or will receive some good fortune or wealth and when the day arrives, the event occurs as was foreseen. This is called Anagata Sanyana. The third gnosis, Asavakaya jnana is usually rendered as the knowledge and understanding that destroys the asavas, the taints. I would like to analyse this point a little because it has been the source of doubts for a very long time. If this phrase is translated as the knowledge and understanding of the one who has destroyed the asavas, it would be clearer. All gnosis, all supernormal powers, are born of jhana, but if asavakaya jnana is considered to, to destroy it, then it is tantamount to saying that mere attainment of jhana can fulfil the function of magasamangi. Such a contention would directly contradict the teaching that it is magasamangi alone, i.e. the simultaneous manifestation of all eight factors of the Eightfold Path, that destroys defilements at each moment of insight. The three kinds of gnosis are born of jhana, and jhana can only provide knowledge of things outside the mind. It is incapable of knowing the defilements within the heart. The Buddha never spoke of any one of the various forms of gnosis as destroyers of defilement. That was an epithet reserved exclusively for the path, which makes the translation of the phrase asavakaya jnana as the gnosis that causes the destruction of the asava, all the more perplexing. May all the wise people who read this book contemplate the matter, and if your conclusions do not agree with the one that I am offering, please write and let me know. I will be most grateful. Asavakaya jnana is not a form of gnosis, that is born of jhana. It is exceptional. All jhanas up to and including the cessation of feeling and perception are mundane. I have never seen a passage in which the Buddha describes the factors of a transcendent or supramundane jhana. However, if those meditators who have attained the supramundane stage of understanding enters a jhana, then that jhana is considered supramundane. It's like the king's sword, which is given the special name, Prakan. In fact, 
A prakan is just an ordinary sword, albeit a very fine one, but because it belongs to the king, we give it a special name. Similarly, one may understand this term asavakayanyana more easily if one interprets it as the knowledge of one who has already put an end to defilements. Jhana is also described in terms of three forms of bhavanga, bhavangupada, bhavangucharana, and bhavangupacheda, while samadhi is divided into kanika, upachara, and apana. In jhana, defilements are merely suppressed. There is no abandonment of defilement in jhana. With samadhi, the progressive abandonment of defilement is described as follows. The sotapanna, stream enterer, is able to abandon three defilements, embodiment view, skeptical doubt, and attachment to external observances. The sakadagami, once returner, abandons the above three defilements and in addition attenuates sensual desire and aversion. The anagami, non-returner, is able to abandon all of the above five defilements. This clearly demonstrates that jhana is mundane and samadhi, through abandoning defilements, is supramundane. Although it's true that jhana is mundane, the medita- meditator training in samadhi must, as a matter of course, first pass through it, as the two states of jhana and samadhi are interchangeable using skillful means. Given that they both arise from a single source, it is inevitable that sooner or later, no one training the mind can avoid experiencing both of them. Jhana and the initial stages of samadhi are the meditator's training ground. Then, having disciplined himself in both jhana and samadhi until he is proficient, able to discriminate finally between what is correct and what is not, the meditator may effectively develop vipassana, insight. Vipassana is not at all the easy thing that most people imagine. Some meditators experience on occasion the passage of the mind into jhana and samadhi and then assume that they have reached this or that stage of attainment. In fact, they don't really know what stage they've reached, whether it's jhana or samadhi or whatever, but just go ahead and brag about it. Subsequently, that state of concentration declines and becomes inaccessible to them. Samadhi has great poise and gracefulness, but in a different way to jhana. It's the difference between one who plays a sport for health and one who plays for the sheer delight of it. When the mind merges into samadhi, one is aware that it is doing so. There is a constant knowing. Mindfulness notes the coarseness or subtlety of the mind at every moment of consciousness. When the mind is still coarse, the knowing is restricted to the outer, but as it becomes more refined, there is knowing of both inner and outer. One is undeceived by the different states of mind. One knows both the mind that is Dhamma and the mind that is still caught up in the world. One is not restricted to a single perspective. The mind of one who sees in this way will be equanimous, able to let go of all mental states. He may or may not act in any given circumstance, but if he does choose to act, his actions will invariably be measured, appropriate and beneficial. Samadhi is characteristic of one mature in conduct, jhana of one still immature. In Samadhi, apart from the same nimittas and forms of gnosis that I have already described as arising in jhana, One may also attain knowledge of some matter through the manifestation of a verse or a voice, sometimes embodied, sometimes not. In every case, such phenomena consist of warnings, either of some looming danger or else the correctness or incorrectness of some action one has committed. Thus the nimittas and gnosis that arise during the development of samadhi are most important and have been tools for teachers and those in spiritual authority since the time of the Buddha himself. Such nimittas and knowledge arise on the level of upachara samadhi, although the perceiver of them 
may not realise he is in that stage. They may appear at any time, when standing up, sitting in formal meditation, lying in a meditation posture, or even while walking around. There have been many people who, before they ever visited my monastery, had foreknowledge that the place was of such and such a terrain and appearance. When they actually came here and saw the place, it did not differ in a single respect from their vision. Whether this is due to the attainment of jhana and samadhi, to their accumulated merit, or to having been here in a former time, cannot be ascertained. However, if any of these people are asked if they have ever meditated to the level of samadhi and jhana, they always say no. All these nimittas and knowledges arise intermittently. The knowledge they convey is not always true in the case of one who is not yet adept at entering samadhi, for he encounters them as soon as he enters the state of upachara. However, one who is adept will first enter samadhi to the level of apana, absorption, and then withdraw to upachara. When he wishes to know about some event, he will consciously turn his mind towards it and then dwell in equanimity. If there is something to be known, the knowledge will spontaneously arise. If not, it will not. If it should happen that some knowledge arises in the mind at this point, it will be completely trustworthy and true in every respect. That is not the way people go about it these days. Before we have even experienced jhana or samadhi once, craving arises, wanting to see this and know that. When our desires are not fulfilled, we give up all our efforts and seek to excuse ourselves in various ways. We have too little merit to progress or we don't have what it takes and so on. Actually, we were on the right track. The results we obtained were in fact fine. If you can be at peace with whatever results you have achieved, you will be all right. You cannot pit your accumulated merit and purity of character against that of a person who has been practicing for a long time. You may be able to compete with him rowing a boat down the river, but where merit is concerned, it is utterly impossible. No matter how much effort they put forth, some people never experience any nimittas or gnosis, but providing they do not relent in their efforts, they are able to realize the fruit of practice just the same. A person who has the four patisambhida, analytical knowledges, and the six abhinya, supernormal knowledges, and the person who has none of them, become one in their realization of nibbana. The meditator who is not yet proficient must take the preliminary meditation object as his stay. Whenever he meditates, he begins by concentrating on it. It is indispensable to him. The best preliminary object is the recollection of death. After contemplating death, nothing remains in the mind. Any object will suffice for the adept, or he may disregard the preliminary object altogether and directly contemplate the distinctive mood of that object from the start. The mind converges naturally. When one has been concentrating on the meditation object for some time, one will begin to feel lazy and reluctant to contemplate. One becomes enamoured of the peace that has arisen, is content with what has already been achieved. In fact, this is heedlessness. Not even vipassana transcends this contemplation of death. But whereas in vipassana, the contemplation provides a clear perception of the arising and passing away of all phenomena, together with their relevant causes and conditions, in samadhi and jhana, although there, there is also contemplation, one sees only certain aspects of the process. It's not a clear, vivid perception that encompasses the causes and conditions. However, meditators tend to take this partial knowledge to be complete and take themselves to have seen the whole thing. To give an example, there was a certain lady in the monastery who said she'd seen the whole thing. She'd seen the impermanence of all things, how our bodies are doomed to break up and disintegrate. Her meditation reached the point that she would enter Bhavanga at the mealtime and 
just sitting there in a trance, forget to eat. On one occasion, she was in charge of making a hot drink to offer to the monks and sat in front of the pot absorbed until all the water had boiled away. Then one day, while sitting in meditation, her body rose up and lay down by the side of the road. Just then, a car happened to be rapidly approaching. The thought came to the old lady that she was going to die, but a voice in her heart said, What of it? Death is just death. Here is as good a place as any. The car continued towards her, getting closer and closer, and just as as it was about to reach her, she suddenly jumped up. You see, the clinging to self was lurking away deep inside. Even though her meditation had reached the stage where she could dwell totally unaware of her body and senses, the grasping within still remained. You must contemplate death frequently, until you are skilled, until you see a rising and passing away and the outcome of it. You must contemplate death until you see it in its true light as a perfectly natural phenomenon, until you are firmly confident that when faced with death, you will not waver. Name and form, i.e. the mind and the body, arise and pass away separately. Thus, when experiencing a physical pain, sages such as the Buddha separate the mind from the body and so remain at ease. At conception, firstly, the Sambhava Dahatu, or what nowadays is referred to as the sperm and the egg, of the parents combine and then rebirth consciousness enters that compound and adheres to it. If the parents datu combine abnormally, as for instance in the case of deficiency on one side, such as a red or abnormal colouring, then the combination will not gel and the rebirth consciousness will find nowhere to establish itself. Thus it is said that material form arises first and mind enters it, and takes rebirth afterwards. At the time of death, the mind ceases first, followed by the body. One may see in a dead person that although the mind has ceased all its activity, the body is still warm, the cells and organs, the nervous system still remain. Those people who revive after doctors have pronounced them dead resume using the same cells. That concludes the Dhamma teaching, Only the World Ends, by the Venerable Arjun Tate. If you'd like to hear more talks by Arjun Tate and other meditation masters of the forest tradition of Theravada Buddhism, please subscribe to the Forest Path podcast using your favorite podcast app. I want to take this opportunity to to thank recent supporters for their donations that have been received via Ko-Fi in the past month. These donations pay for the online services like podcast hosting, web hosting and the online tools that make these podcasts available for free. Your generous support makes Dharma available and free of charge for all. Thank you so much for your kind support. The Forest Path Podcast is part of the Everyday Dharma Network. If you go to the everydaydharma.net homepage, you can discover more about the three other podcasts on the network also. This podcast is produced and narrated by Sol Hanna. If you like these audio resources that I'm making available for free in a convenient podcast format, you may want to become a supporter or even a member of the Dhamma Network on the Ko-Fi Creators platform. There are links in the description below. Thank you for listening. May you all experience insight and peace. Thank you.